It's a magic mic that doesn't work when I speak into it. Um, so welcome, my name's Angie Doyle. I'm an Agile coach from South Africa. I've been working in Agile teams for about 10 years. It's gonna be interesting. Hi, my name's Talia Lancaster. I'm also an Agile coach. I work for one of the top three banks in South Africa by day, and then by night I have a graphic recording company, so I do visualizations for companies. So, how many of you have heard of high-performing teams? I want you to stand up if you've heard of high-performing teams, high-performance teams. Okay, awesome. So most people have heard of high-performance teams. It's even been mentioned today, so that's a good sign. Now, stay standing if you've ever been part of a high-performance team. So it doesn't have to be work, it could be like a social committee, it could be a religious group, it could be the military. So if you've ever been part of a high performance team, you can stay standing. So there's quite a few of you. I want to know what are the behaviours that you saw in these high performing teams? So just kind of throw out a couple of behaviours that you saw. Okay, so transparency. Shared goals. Shared goals and responsibilities. What else? Commitment and focus. Maybe another two more. Okay, openness, willingness to kind of embrace new stuff. What else? One more. So they're biased for execution. They're kind of focused on delivery. Okay, great. Okay, okay so stay standing for a second. We're going to run a different experiment, right? So stay standing if the team was a work team. Okay? If the team that you were part of was a work team. Okay? A work team. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've lost a few. And now stay standing if that team that you were part of that was high performance was an agile team. Awesome, that's good. <laughs> okay, so it's interesting because not all agile teams are necessarily high performance. So what we're talking about today is how to build that intentional culture of high performance. You can, you can grab a seat. You don't have to stay standing for the rest of it. Thank you for your participation. So like Talia said, we don't want to leave creating an environment for high performance to chance. We want to be incredibly intentional about creating a culture where teams can accelerate to high performance really quickly. Otherwise, it actually takes them a really long time. So those teams that you were working with, chances are you probably worked with each other for more than six, six months to about two years. That's actually when you start building up the levels of trust to get you to high performance. So we found that when we lift off teams, their ability to get to high performance is significantly faster. And we initially did it with like some random techniques that we used with our teams on what kind of felt right at the time. And eventually we came across something called the Team Canvas. So this isn't our canvas, but it's something that basically captured every bit about what we do in our team liftoffs. So we're gonna work through techniques for each of those different segments as part of today. Now you're not gonna do, you know, we don't have enough time to do every single activity for every single section. So we're going to talk through the first half of the canvas and just give you an idea of some of the techniques. And then we're going to take you through another three techniques and you'll have an opportunity to practice one of them before the end of the workshop. And you'll notice that the slides, the booklets in front of you, don't look like the slides up here. And that's because we've actually given you these techniques and more in your book. So you're welcome. If we don't have an opportunity to practice, you can just take it back with you and practice them with your teams uh, back home as well. Okay. okay and maybe, an important point to <laughs> maybe an important point to mention is that this usually takes about two days. Okay, so we're going to kind of skim through it and just maybe give you some inspiration for things that you can do. Um, and it is also separate from your product liftoff. Um, so this is focusing on the team, the team dynamic, roles and responsibilities, some of the words that were mentioned earlier. Um, a product liftoff would be separate. So 
your product liftoff would tend to take another three days on top of a team liftoff. So in total, when we lift off teams, we look at getting a week, which is a huge investment for companies, but we've actually started getting enough data to show them the value behind doing this. Okay, so we're gonna kick off with that little heart, like the, the center of the team canvas. If you ever need to refer back to it, the team canvas is in the front of your booklet. Okay, so um, our clicker's not working, so I'm just gonna have to... Okay, so the center of the canvas, the center of the canvas is the purpose for the team, okay? So this is why are we doing what we're doing? Why does the team exist? Um, in the background, there's a very beautiful video playing of a non-profit organization in South Africa. Um, and we're using this more of an example of things you can do with your teams, okay? So this, it doesn't have to be as beautifully produced as this, but you can actually use videos to connect your teams with a purpose. Um, so you could take video footage just on your phone of the customers or the people that you're serving and use that in some of your events to reconnect your team with why they exist. Um, there are also other techniques in your book. Um, so this one is a Jeffrey Moore. It's actually based on the um, product kind of purpose, product vision model, and we've adapted it for teams. So Angie and I also love visuals, as you could maybe tell. So this is a poster that we created for a team that we actually work through to define the purpose. There's some other techniques as well in your, in your booklet. So we're going to move on to the next part of the canvas, which is people and roles. And this is essentially trying to figure out who do we have in our team, what are our names, what are our roles, and what are our responsibilities. Now, I'm assuming since we're at an Agile conference, everybody here is working with Agile teams. Is that a, an accurate assumption? Okay. So we all know that in, in a framework like Scrum, there's not meant to be any roles, right? You're meant to have a development team. And what we've noticed, and I don't know if it's the same in India, but we'll create a team and people will still have baggage associated to the role that they came across with. So they used to be a business analyst and there's this expectation of what business analysts are meant to do. Or they used to be a tester and there's an assumption that the rest of the team has about what they're going to only be doing in a team. Now the problem is when we make assumptions about roles, what tends to happen? If we get it wrong, there's usually conflict, right? We're like, why didn't you do this thing? You did it before when you were a BA. You should still be doing that same thing now. And you're like, but I'm not a BA anymore. I'm now part of the team and we're sharing responsibilities. So what we want to do as part of this people and roles section is we want to get rid of any hidden assumptions in a team because that is where most of your conflict is going to lie. So we came up with a technique and we've run it with numerous teams and it tends to work pretty well. Um, how we start off with is we'll put, we'll put a whole bunch of these posters up on the walls around a room and we will put, we'll ask people to write down their role that they came across with. So we're going to use a Scrum Master as an example here. We then ask them to go stand at a different poster and they start writing down what they think the roles and responsibilities are for that role or for that title. So they'll put down a whole bunch of stuff, we'll give them about five minutes to do it on the first poster, then they'll shift to the next role in the team. So they never go visit their own poster, they're always visiting somebody else's poster role. So we'll systematically go through, someone else will come up, and we'll do some more, and Eventually, the whole team has made it through every single role. And what we do is we just reduce the amount of time that you're spending at each poster because you're pretty much only writing stuff down that isn't there already. And at the end, what we do is the person who, whose role it is will come and start having a look at what other people think they are going to be doing in the team. And they'll say, yeah, this one looks pretty good. I agree with that one. This one looks like my role. Absolutely. I don't do this. And then how do you think we sort it out as a team? So where we have disagreements over the roles, what do you think we should do? Probably discuss it, right? Because this is our opportunity. I mean, it actually came up this morning in the, key, in the keynote for Holacracy, 
where they were talking about making expectations absolutely explicit. This is what we're doing. We're now saying, I don't do this, but it probably needs to be done in the team. So who is going to do it? Or if I'm going to do it, I'm not happy with how it's worded. So we might then just change the wording to something I'm more comfortable with. And how we end it off is we usually sign it because it's a little bit like your contract with the team. It's like the signing's like a superficial thing. It's like I'm committing to do this stuff. And this is kind of a finished product that we had with one of our teams. Um, the Scrum Master was Anna Linda. And you can see there's something, there's a lot of ticks here. If you can't see it at the back, there's like four ticks against something. And she was absolutely determined that she was not a PA as a Scrum Master, because in the team they were like, maybe she does our bookings and our minutes and stuff like that. And over here, she disagreed that she would need to make uh, sure that the design questions get raised timelessly. So once we've cycled through the team and everybody's had an opportunity to clarify their role and their responsibilities, we're one step closer to actually working as a functioning, high-performing team. I'm going to give the mouse one more try. Let's see. Nope. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so now that we've defined the roles and the responsibilities, we actually want to take it a step further. So we want to look at the strengths and weaknesses, the strengths and assets, and weaknesses and risks for the team. Okay, so this is slightly different from roles, but a technique that we find works very well, it's actually a management 3.0 technique, um, is called the competency matrix. So what you do is you make a nice grid like this, um, I always get confused, this is a column, right? Okay, so the first column, you're going to actually start writing down the skills that you need in a team. Okay, so let's maybe get some examples. So let's assume that we are a software development team. What are some of the skills that we may need in that team? Functional. Okay, so I'm going to put coding because that's the easy one. What kind of... Cool. Okay, so JavaScript. Are there any other languages that you need in that team? Okay, so this is a mobile mobile app team. <laughs> cool. What else? Analysis. I heard design. So design, you might also want to say, is it UX? Is it UI? Okay, UI. Let's also put UX here as a separate one, because some people may be strong in UI, but not strong in UX. Testing. Cool. What about other skills that may not be completely technical, but might be softer skills? Product management. So this is an interesting one, right? Because we're looking at skills, not roles. So what does a product owner do? Value maximization. Collaboration. Okay, so you may want to stakeholder management. I want to put your stake management. Okay, so remember you want to stick to the roles. So instead of putting their scrum master, what are the? I mean, stick to the skills. What are the skills that? So maybe it's coaching, maybe it's facilitation. It's these kind of skills that you actually need in the team. Why do you think we do that and we don't put roles? Hundred percent. Yeah. So you're all here when <coughs> talk about the microphone. Yeah, so roles are not explicit. So other people could pick up on very specific things. Yeah. And, and maybe you've got a developer who's strong in facilitation. Um, so this is an opportunity to get a, a really clear view of the skills that you have in the team. Um, okay, cool. And now, what you do is on the top row, you're going to put your team name. So we've got a very sad team because it's just Angie and I. Okay, so for now we're just going to keep it to that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we can build this <laughs> app. <laughs> and then another layer to add onto this is to actually distinguish between level of competence. So here we've got advanced, intermediate, and novice. So each person will then go down the list of skills and indicate what skills they have, and over and above that as well, what level. Okay. Um, so we're just doing this as an example. Our team is very sad. 
Can I do analysis, probably? Okay, so you're going to go through and you're going to indicate kind of where you're sitting in terms of the skills within your team. The value of this comes in using this for various ways, right? So firstly, you're going to look at your strengths. So you could say, okay, green and blue are quite high. So Angie and I are actually really good at facilitation. Um, so, so we're pretty strong there. However, neither of us can do stakeholder management. So that's actually a risk. If that's a skill that you require in the team, best we find someone else who can do it. Um, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, we didn't want to lie. We really can't do <laughs> this JavaScript. Okay, so we really can't do JavaScript. Um, so that's also a big risk. There's going to be no app. We'll have lots of facilitated <laughs> workshops, but. <laughs> okay, and then what we do as well is we, we actually indicate there, we ask people to indicate things that they really don't enjoy doing. Okay, so maybe um, Angie's pretty good at UI, but she actually hates it. So she's going to put on there a sad face. Um, I don't really like analysis. Okay, why do you think we do that? Okay, so... Cool. So maybe that person does it just because they're good at it or they know it. If that person does this every day for years, do you think they'll enjoy being part of that team? No, exactly. So that's something that you then need to look at, upskilling other people in the team or getting someone else so that that person is not doing something that they hate every day. Okay. Cool. So that's your... Um, your strengths and assets, weaknesses and, uh, and risks. And then there's an example of one that we actually did with a team. So you can see it's substantially larger than our sad little team. Um, and it's a really great tool to use even for succession planning, uh, interests, you could find a way maybe to indicate there what interests people have in terms of upskilling. So it's a very powerful tool this for your team. Now that we know who's in the team and what skills we have, we want to figure out how do we communicate and keep everybody in the team up to date. So this is probably what you're the most familiar with in teams. This is your typical working agreements that you'd see in agile teams. So we were in a talk earlier, he referred to it as a social contract. Um, usually for the, the teams that we see, working agreements tend to look a little bit more like this. So they've got things like your team name. And I don't know if it's the same here, but we usually, it's quite related to pop culture. So Captain Marvel's coming out. Like if we started with the team, it would be like the Avengers and someone would be Captain Marvel and someone else would be Captain America. And they'd actually kind of cycle through, but they'd, they'd tie it into the team name so that you're not landing up being the asset finance replacement system team or like something terrible like that. Cool. And then you're also going to discuss things like your method of collaboration. Okay, so what tools are you going to use to communicate with each other? Are you going to use Slack? Are you going to use Zoom? And it's important to, to make sure that everyone in the team has access to that tool. So the last thing you want is people battling to get in and to actually collaborate with the rest of the team. So speaking about collaboration, something that we do in South Africa a lot as well is we collaborate with a lot of teams in India. So we've got quite a hot topic that we have to have conversations about with our boards. So do we have a virtual board or do we have a physical board or do we have some kind of a hybrid between us where in India our team has a, a physical board in South Africa, we have a physical one and we have a high level one and some kind of a collaboration tool. And we've got to make sure we can all access that because I don't know if you guys have experienced it, but a lot of companies block access to a lot of these tools. So like we worked with one team where all we had was Google Google Sheets. That's all we could <laughs> collaborate with and then they took it away from us. Okay, and then it's very important as well to discuss things like your core working hours. And these are often the things that we don't really think about, um, but it's important to identify if people have possibly commitments or 
um, special kind of times that we need to consider. So in South Africa, we actually have a very like multicultural and we have multiple religions within our teams. So for example, this is a point where you say, okay, but I'm Jewish, I need to leave early on a Friday for Shabbat dinner, I need to be home before sunset. So please don't schedule meetings late on a Friday afternoon. A, because it's really not a nice thing to do. Like we shouldn't be doing that anyway. And B, because I, there is a particular religious kind of consideration. And it's important. It may not be important to, or other people in the team may not realize it, but to that individual, it's really going to make a difference. Okay, and there's other stuff. Um, so Adam Weisbot's got a really cool uh, guide that you can go through. We're not going to touch on all of them, but um, definition of ready, definition of done, team calendar, all of these things that we generally do in the working agreement. Possibly the one thing that we see a lot of teams don't do is focusing on a conflict protocol. Now, especially when we first create a team, it's like you're in that honeymoon period. It's like you're never going to have a fight. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. Um, and we've actually got to figure out our divorce agreement before we even go on our first date. Because at some point, there is going to be conflict in the team, and we've got to figure out how do we handle it when it does come up. Because when's the worst part or the worst point to start handling conflict? It's when you're in the middle of the conflict. So this could be something as silly, and what we usually do with teams is we literally just come up with a safe word initially until they build up a higher level of trust. So a safe word will be a word that someone will call out, and when we hear it, we have an agreement that we break for five minutes. You are not allowed to continue with that conversation. Everybody leaves the room. You come back in five minutes or 15 minutes, and you agree on how to proceed. And sometimes how you proceed is you have that conversation the next day once everybody's had an opportunity to kind of regain all of these skills. Because when you're in conflict and it feels super hectic, you don't want to then still continue with that conversation. So something as simple as a safe word kind of gets teams set up on the right track initially. And eventually, we actually build up quite a detailed conflict protocol with our teams. But this is something we see so few teams doing in the agile space. And there is conflict. Like, it's high pressure. So it is something we should focus on. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So that's really boards. So like, are we, do we have physical boards? Uh, do we, when we're collaborating um, on requirements, are we maybe visualizing our models? And if we're doing that and we've got distributed teams, how are we gonna bring them in? So we have to do a lot of whiteboard collaboration, but we can't do it in a room because we're working with distributed teams. So like, what tools are we gonna use? Do we have access to them? That kind of thing. Happy with that? Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 the safe word and then breaking for five minutes is a good one initially. Once they've built up trust, we start introducing things like having a soft startup. So a soft startup is where you know it's going to be a tricky conversation and you know it's probably could offend someone. So how you enter the conversation is really important. And we'll actually say, I'm going to try a soft startup. And it kind of gets the other person, okay, I know you're trying to make something a bit softer. So I'm, I'm going to try not to take it too personally initially. But that kind of thing you can't do with people that have only just started working with each other. It takes time to build up trust to kind of get to that point. So we usually put like a quick and dirty fix in with that safe word initially. And then after about three to five sprints, we'll start bringing in a more substantial conflict agreement where we actually talk about when we enter a conflict situation, how do we speak to each other? What are the no-go areas? So what am I, we, we also often will unpack what is a no-go for you? What are you not prepared to negotiate on? And what am I not prepared to negotiate on? But our next one actually talks about what's acceptable behavior in a team, which actually leads into your conflict, your conflict protocol as well. This is just, an, again, it's visual. So it's just an example of how we build up these agreements so that it's not one person, usually the Scrum Master, sitting and typing up the stuff in a PowerPoint or in some kind of a system. OK. So the next section, so now that we know um, kind of our ground rules as a team, we're going to delve into some of the activities that are a bit deeper. 
So the last three that we're going to cover now on the canvas, you will actually have an opportunity to practice one of them. So these are one of the activities, okay? So values, maybe to that point, it's what do we stand for and how do we show it? So how many of you have values in your companies? Yeah, everyone, hey? Are they, they those nice words on the wall? Uh, like integrity, trust, respect. Yeah, so, so one of the things with values is because those words are so big, sometimes it's difficult to actually understand the behavior that we need to live every day. So it's not enough to, uh, for us to just have a value. We need to actually unpack to a lower level around the behaviors. So a good example um, in South Africa is the word respect. So in kind of like Western cultures, Respect is things like if someone very important comes into a room, you stand up and you look at them in the eye. Whereas in Zulu culture, it's extremely disrespectful to look at someone older than you or more senior than you in the eye. So what sometimes happens is there's this miscommunication around behaviors because people are kind of sitting down as you enter the room or they're avoiding eye contact and in their culture, they're actually being extremely respectful. But to the other person, they may not interpret it that way. So what we encourage with teams is actually identifying your values and then unpacking the behaviors around that value. Um, <laughs> so what we do, so we actually start off with a big values list. Uh, it's also a management 3.0 technique. So there, there are lots of values on this. Uh, Angie and I tried to count, I think they're about 200, um, but it's a good place to start. So what we do is in the teams, you each have an opportunity as an individual to just skim through that list and circle your top five values. Um, we've run this a couple of times where people take quite long to do this. The trick is here to just skim, okay? So if you don't kind of connect with a word, then it's probably not your value. Okay, so you're going to identify the words that you really connect with as an individual. What we sometimes do to kind of save time on this exercise, depending on how long we've got to lift off a team, is we might actually just go with the scrum value. So we'll go with respect, collaboration, commitment, focus, um, and openness. Okay. Cool. So then once you've done that, um, you're going to consolidate it onto one list, okay? So that first part is individual. Then you're going to actually take a piece of paper, so an A3 piece of paper, and you're going to go around the circle and kind of start writing down your individual values. So you have one list of all of your top values. Um, you're then going to use dot voting. Do you guys use dot voting? It's a very, yeah, I think, yeah, we preaching to the, <laughs> the converted, yeah, okay. So dot voting is like currency, three dots, use them as you like. Try not to vote for the values. Try not to vote only for your values. So you're trying to pick values that are best for the team. Um, yeah, okay, so you're gonna vote, and then from there you're gonna get your top three to five values for the team. Um, and then what we do, which is really fun, uh, is we actually create this poster. So on the top there, the atmosphere section is your values. So that's three to five values for the team. Um, and atmosphere is almost like the perfume of the room. So it's something that you can kind of sense, but you may not be able to, it's not tangible, okay? That's how you want people to feel in the team. Um, and then around the edges, there's strips of colorful paper. And those are actually your behaviors. So after you've done the values, you then pair up and you start to unpack how do we live those values every day. So we work best together when. And you write a whole bunch of statements. So what you're not going to write is something like we work best together when we respect each other. Okay. Because that's obvious. What does respect mean? So what is the behavior that we're looking for? And that could be things like, and I know in a lot of the teams that we work with, they say respect is being um, for meetings on time. Because like that's how you demonstrate that you respect my time as much as you respect yours. So like that would be a behavior that if your value was respect, that could be a behavior that would come out of the conversation. Cool. Thanks. And then, uh, yeah, so then you end up with this beautiful poster. It's nice and visual. So you can actually put it up near your team so it reminds everyone and it it is a living 
artifact. So you can keep adding and assessing those behaviors as you go. Okay, so now we know what we really stand for and believe in and how we're gonna show it to other people. We wanna know how are we as a group going to achieve things together, certain goals together, and what do I as an individual want to achieve? So there's two different types of goals on the team canvas. There's a common goal that's a team goal. And usually those are the things that get converted into metrics in companies. It's the kind of things that they'll put a metric in and they'll say, if you achieve these goals, we know that you are successful. But there's also the personal goal side. And so often we forget about people in a team have personal goals too. So I'm going to use an example of a team we worked with where there was a business analyst who was trying to become a CBAP, which is a certified business analyst professional and everything he, he was lacking on some of the knowledge areas that he needed to submit his application so he was very eager about getting stuck into certain types of work now if he hadn't made that goal explicit with the team they would have thought he was I don't know jockeying for some kind of a position or that there was an ulterior motive like why does this guy only want to do this kind of work and he never wants to jump in and help out with other stuff but by making that personal goal absolutely explicit that this was a career path for him and something that he had chosen the team were a lot more flexible in saying this is the kind of work we've got it sounds like that work that you need to get the certification do you want to do it so it can go on your portfolio of evidence so it's the two types the team goal and then the personal goal and how we do do this in teams is we find it really hard to come up with goals. I don't know if you found that as well. They tend to be like these beauty queen statements, like I want world peace or something like that. Like they're very high level. They're not tangible enough. You're like, what do you mean by this thing? And everybody has heard of smart goals, right? But we tend to do it so badly. So we'll go through smart and then we'll show you what we've actually done. It's a different technique that we've come up for that we, that we do with our team. So your typical SMART, so specific, we want to be specific about what we want to achieve. So there we typically go into what, why, when, not usually the how, that's going to be something we're going to unpack in more detail in the sprints, but we go into, we, we try to get really clear about what it is we're trying to do. Okay, and then the M is for measurable. So this is your metrics. So it's important when setting goals to understand kind of where are you at currently, so what's that baseline metric, and then how do we know that we've achieved what we're trying to achieve? So kind of what is that metric for success? The A, achievable. So can we actually visualize the path? And I think we don't want it to be super easy because I think that just encourages like teams to be really average and we're looking for high performance. So we want these things to be challenging, but they still need to be within grasp. So I always say like, I think a better word there would be feasible. Is it a feasible thing? But then it wouldn't say smart. It would say like smurfed or something like that and it wouldn't be quite as catchy. So achievable, can we actually do it as a team? Okay, and then relevant. So that's actually a time for you to assess if it's in line with the organizational strategy. So is this goal actually relevant for what we're trying to do as a company? Um, and I think this is also important. We don't just set goals blindly. Let's critique it and let's be very critical of, of that strategic alignment. Time bound is super important in agile teams because goals that go too far into the future are immediately unachievable because they're probably too big to break down into something we could deliver in a sprint. So when we talk about time frames, what could we do in a year? What could we do in six months? What could we do in three months? What could we do in six weeks? What could we start tomorrow? So actually be quite mindful about kind of having these small iterations that we can deliver on. So that's great, but it's not enough for Agile teams. There needs to be a feedback loop. Okay, so we've added, we're gonna make smart goals even smarter. So we've added in that, almost that inspect and adapt element to it. So E would be evaluate, and this is an opportunity for you to look at your goal and see maybe you've achieved the goal, and that's great, but you need to go back and check. Or maybe that goal is no longer relevant. So the R would then be to rethink. So rethink or reset. If you've achieved your goal, then reset a new one. Or if your goal is no longer relevant, then, then create a new one from scratch. So we played around with it and we came up with a canvas. Um, Tell you and I have this really corny joke, like canvases are so hot right now. Everybody wants a canvas for everything. So this is our canvas for smarter goals. 
Um, but we've actually also in the process of creating a game for this. So there's a game that we actually have started playing with teams and we're busy ironing out like the final details to make it a little, like even more collaborative than it already is. Um, and essentially this is one of the teams that we worked with. So I just rewrote it because the original version was super messy. But it was really about how does the team increase blog traffic? And after unpacking all of the different questions underneath the smart uh, the, the different specific measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, we landed up with a revised goal statement. So we started there where it says initial goal statement, increase blog traffic, and the revised goal statement says, you can see it was a while ago, by the 31st of March, our blog will see a 10% increase in traffic by increasing our weekly publishing frequency from three posts per week to five posts per week. Okay, so this again, it's just something to get the team, the team actually collaboratively do this, and then you land up with something that's revised and we start converting it into metrics after this. So the activity, if you choose to do this one a bit later, you'll do a personal goal, because you're probably not sitting in a team or at a table with people that you work with. So you would actually just change it into a personal goal, something that you would want to share with the team so that they can understand some of your behavior. Yeah. It's a team goal. So your team should be delivering a product. Your product metrics are going to be slightly different to your team metrics. So if you had like increased sales by X percentage, you could still use the same format. But what we're looking for is how are we actually going to do it as a team as well. So you could bring in product related goals, but also bring in your team goals because they are going to be slightly different to what your broader organization is going to be expecting of your team. This is almost on what do you expect of each other to get to the next step. Okay. Are you happy with that? You didn't look happy with my answer. <laughs> So now that we've gone through the rest of the canvas, we're now at what is probably the hardest part for teams to deal with. And this is really what do each of us need in order to be satisfied and feel whole in a team. Because you do have needs. You've got personal needs that have to be fulfilled in a team, and very often we brush over this kind of thing. Um, when we do our liftoffs with teams, we very often don't do this as part of the liftoff. We give the team some time to actually get to know each other. Because this is quite deeply personal. It's not the kind of thing you're just going to blurt out with people and say, this is what I need to feel like a whole person. You know, you need to actually see if it's, you need to create that safe space before we even get into this conversation. Once we do, we usually do this as part of a retrospective. And we play a bit of a game with the teams. So we came up, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the Center for Nonviolent Communication. It's quite an interesting website. Go check it out. There's a lot of things about feelings and needs in there. And we used their list of needs and we identified a common set of 10 needs that most teams need. So you can see we just created like little playing cards and we came up with the top 10. And all you do is you just order them in importance for you. So you'll put them from left to right on a table or from top to bottom in order of priority, and you'll land up with a sequence of needs that's relevant to you as an individual. The other thing I forgot to mention about this game is you do it in silence. You actually don't talk at all when you're playing this game. This is a silent game because talking kind of eliminates the opportunities for introverts to have an opportunity like to start thinking. Okay, so introverts tend to need silence to think about stuff, to have confidence to say something. Extroverts need to speak. Um, very often this gives you an idea of what you want to say as an extrovert. So it kind of levels the playing fields for everyone. And then if we don't have your need, there's some spare cards. It's like a gift card where you can write down your own need that isn't represented in the, the, the pack. So you order them down and you land up with a prioritized list and at the top, you're going to have your top three to five needs. And then we write something that's almost a bit like a user story. So we'll say something like, as Angie, um, I need the space to be creative. So I request from the team the opportunity to include visual elements in our requirement discussions. Okay, so I'm telling the team that I need a creative space. Because if I don't get the opportunity to draw stuff up on walls and have those kinds of conversations, I'm not going to be satisfied doing the work that I do. Now, if I don't tell the team that I need this and I keep picking up pens and drawing models on walls, it's going to look pretty self-indulgent. 
you know, I'm gonna, they're going to be, oh, this chick, all she wants to do is like draw stuff on walls. But if I tell them that it's something that keeps me fulfilled as a person, teams tend to be a little more open to that. So we write these needs cards down. You can write down as many as you want for as many needs as you want. And what you do is you then pass the pack of the needs cards to the person to the left of you, and they read through it. And if they've got a question, like if they're not sure what you're asking of them, they might write down a question on a post-it note and just say, I'm not really sure what you're asking of me to help you satisfy this need. The, the idea isn't that you question that person's need. A need is a need, and that's not, like it's not under debate for other people. But you're kind of saying, this is what I need from you to help me achieve this need. Or this is, this is what I expect to kind of see in the team. And then very often what happens is this becomes one of those we work best together when statements on our, um, on our atmosphere poster. So we'll actually add in some more behaviors that we want to introduce in the team that'll start helping to create that space where people can satisfy their needs at work. Because if you're not getting this fulfillment out of your team, I mean, you're spending most of your life with your team. You're not spending it with your family. So you want to make sure that this stuff is clear because you want to be fulfilled and a whole person when you, when you go to work. This is quite a, it's, it is quite a sensitive exercise, um, but it's incredibly valuable. So once we get to this level in a team, we, we sort of know we've reached that point of almost being kind of high performance. We've now really laid the groundwork well. We recommend doing the needs after the team's been running for a couple of sprints. Purely because if you haven't created a good safe space, you're going to get very superficial needs that'll come out of the team. And we, we want people to be real with this. This is the stuff that's going to make them love being in the team. So we, we suggest doing it after. If you've already with a team and you're just going through the team canvas, because we do that when we kick off. So we, we do the team canvas when we kick off teams and when teams need a little bit of a kickstart. So they're kind of in a bit of a, like a bit of a, a rut. Then we'll do a team lift off with them again and then we'll bring this in because they already know each other well enough to have confidence to do this exercise. But this tends to be a little bit edgy for a lot of people when they first start in a team. Not initially, and give them the heads up that you'll get to it in about three to five sprints. So when it comes in in the retrospective, they know it's coming. Okay. And how do you manage uh, unrealistic, unreasonable, and conflicting needs? So I'll be honest, I haven't come across. Uh, so the question was, how do you handle unrealistic, unreasonable needs? Um, you would have a conversation as a team. That's why it's so important to have the high trust level. So if someone's asking something of the team that the team can't provide, um, usually the team will say, we can't do all of that. That's a non-negotiable, but we can do this part. And then it would be a case of like, is it good enough? And do you feel like we've heard your need? Because we, none of us don't want people to feel fulfilled at work. We all want to create that space. Well, I think we do. Most of the team, I'd say every team I've worked with wants to have a great environment to walk into. So people tend to be quite flexible, but very often they don't know what you're expecting of them. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So if we don't get, uh, so the question was, can this be part of a retrospective? If we don't get our two days to lift off a team, what we will then do is we'll ask for either half a day or a full day, and everything that we haven't got around to we'll bring in as a retrospective um, within the first couple of sprints. So we'll then kind of determine with the team what's the next most important thing to do with them, and we'll bring that technique in. So over time, we build it up, and you, you always revisit it as well. Um, I think it's I think it's different to a retrospective where a retrospective would be looking back. This is almost looking forward, saying how do we want to move forward? How do we want to be an awesome team? Yeah. So you could identify something in a retrospective where maybe we're not behave, we're not living the values that we said we were. Those I work best together win statements, and you could maybe bring it in and just reinforce it with the team. Yeah. So, um, you know, Scrum Masters and that, you you may be able to identify behaviours um, that would benefit from some of these techniques. 
You know what I mean? So even if you've done the lift off, there's no reason why you can't bring in one or two that seem relevant to the team in a retro. So they can be almost like standalone activities. Okay, we've done a lot of talking. <laughs> so it's now an opportunity to practice some of the techniques. So it's important to Angie and I that we create a safe space where you guys can practice um, so that hopefully when you go back to your teams, you feel comfortable to run some of these with your teams. Um, so we've, got, we've prepared three activities. It was the last three sections that we covered. Um, so the first one is the do-it-yourself values. Uh, that's the one with the cloud poster and the colorful paper. Um, and then the that's needs. A very collaborative one. Yeah. If you need a bit of energy, that's a good one because it's only silent for a few minutes at the beginning when you're looking for your values. Yeah. Um, and then the next one is the needs and expectations card game, which is the one that Angie's just explained. Um, it's a bit more challenging and deep, but it's a great place here for you to practice it and see what you think of the technique. Because here, chances are you may not have to work with that person going forward. So you can really be open and honest and, and see, see the technique um, itself. And then the last one is maybe it's kind of towards the end of the day, maybe you're feeling a little bit antisocial. Um, <laughs> so the last one is the Smarter Goals Canvas, um, but we want to actually run it as a personal goals exercise. The challenge is, you know, a lot of you aren't working in the same team, so it may be hard to do like a team goal. So this would be a personal goal um, activity uh, that you could then do, which is also quite silent and, and personal. Um, so we're going to give you a minute or two just to decide in your teams which one tickles your fancy, which one you like. And then, um, then you can come up and just grab, grab a pack that you can run, run with. Okay. And if you don't mind, we'll play some music in the background because a lot of these are quite silent, so it gets a bit awkward. Yes. Okay, so, so realistically, you'll probably only have time to do one. So pick one. If you finish it early, you could always try another one.
So guys, we're going to give you about another five minutes to wrap up the technique that you're on. If you're already finished, you can come grab another one and quickly try and get through as much as you can of another technique. So we've got the values and we've got the personal goals. So grab it and see what you you've got about five minutes. You have to finish that. The needs one. It's got 10 in there. How many of them? 10. You oh, also okay. send out the link and you can print everything you've got. Oh, is it? You can print the booklet. Okay. You can change so like, the cards. Can I take this one and you then? You can take this. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely, sure. you can take this. No Okay, let's take a minute or so to wrap up whatever you're on, and then we're going to have a very quick debrief, and we'll take you through just one or two more slides. You can go ahead with the individual goals for this. Yeah, you can go ahead. You can. You're not going to finish it in the time, but you can. You can take it and work on it. This one we love feedback on because it's still like a work in progress. And we're, we're building a game on it. So we use a lot of the questions in the middle, but it's a very different way of completing it. So if you have feedback for us, the website's there. Uh, smart Canvas, smartcanvas.com, I think it's, oh, it's in the booklet. Um, and you can actually send us feedback on it. If you use it with your teams and it doesn't quite, like something doesn't quite work, let us know and then we, we just fix it. So keeping, we're building that one up because we, we see there's value and we're getting feedback. Sorry? Everything, we will send you the link. You can download everything. You can download the booklet. You can download these. Everything we give to you. So you can, you don't have to have the physical copies here. You can, you can print it off the net.
high bar with auctions with this stuff here. I love this stuff. I have a very oh, high bar with auctions. Oh, awesome. It's all available. Yeah. Should we give like a few more minutes? Even if we finish a little bit early, but we've still got two tabs. So the team canvas, and then we talk through the facilitation guide. So should we ask for some feedback? Yeah. Okay, so I think wherever you got to is fine. Um, we don't expect all the teams to complete this exercise, especially the values one. The values one takes quite a long time. Um, most teams tend to finish the needs one. Uh, and the personal goals one. So we're looking for some feedback. So we had one team doing values and the rest of the teams did the needs game. Maybe team at the back, do you have some feedback on the values one? What did you like? What didn't you like about the technique? Okay, um, yeah, wait, can everyone hear? Yeah, as a team, uh, we all agree, values are most important to work as a team, okay? So uh, we need to have uh, certain values from our individual perspective. How does that map to a team, okay? And then how the team looks on those values. So when we rank those values, how, how it comes out as a team together, okay? That's the most important aspect because when we are working as a team, we, we need to work by values, right? So what team believes in? And does the technique help? Would yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. It worked. And then some of the values were very common between individuals. Um, out of three, we had common indi uh, values. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. When you have as a big yeah. team. But my second point that I want the other teams to take advantage of, you know, you often have consistent values like country. Yeah. So it initially sounds like this big overwhelming list. Yeah. In, yeah, to exactly. So we had one such value here, um, the collaboration and the accountability. When you collaborate, accountability comes together, right? Something like that. Tell me what to do. Yeah, it's kind of being having a diverse group like us. Yeah. Uh, learning comes second, and creativity comes third. Okay, that's so that was for your that's team. That's the trend that we in our group. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And how did people in two, sorry, although there were similar needs, were the, interpre were the interpretations similar, like the ask from the team? And that's the thing, is it's so personal. What does independence mean to me? Okay. Maybe one comment from this team on what worked, what didn't work? I think, as I told, we have uh, two uh, top values. One was learning and the other was cre uh, creativity. And then, as I said, I chose learning, he chose creativity, but our illustrations were kind of uh, same, that everybody wants to learn and grow and like invest their uh, out, out of the box thinking. Right. So we work best together when statement. Mm -hmm. and something that's almost natural for the team. Yep. And kind of we can club creativity and learning. We can make a new value out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then from this table, maybe one more. So we had an interesting conversation around uh, independence and choices. And we did ask, like, how do you differentiate independence and choice? Because independence means autonomy. And just choice means that I, I get to choose what I want, and we understand that it could mean that we have a lot of options to choose from. So, yeah, and then independence could mean different things to different people. What independence is to me may be different to what independence is to another team member, right? Would like to sh share? What I would like to share is that everything here, either values or needs, it's, it's a content, a container, sorry. So it could mean many things to many people. Exactly. So what matters is the conversation and the exercise of doing as a user story. 
uh, was a very interesting clarification exercises for oneself also. Actually, this is important for me, but what do I concretely ask? So that, that was very, very nice. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so hopefully what we've done is we've given you, I mean, this isn't our canvas, but we think it just wraps it up so beautifully what you need in a team, um, which is why we use it, but we definitely want to give credit to the original creators of the team canvas. We just play around with different techniques to get to the end result of what we're looking for. So hopefully today's session was a little bit of inspiration on different techniques you can use within your teams. Um, Talia and I, we often write stuff and we'll publish it, so we've got our Twitter handle handles on the back of our shirts. In the awkward position, but <laughs> they're there. <laughs> they're on our butts, but it's, yeah. So you can follow us on Twitter. Um, we also, in the booklet, um, I think our contact details are on the back. My contact details have changed. Yeah, there's our Twitter handles. It is probably the idiot, but I, I wanted to let you know that everything that you've done in the workshop, you can download and you can use in your teams. So you can even print off a, co a copy of the Liftoff book if you want to share it with Scrum Masters when you go back to work. The cards, we give you the format that we used for the cards. You're welcome to change those as you want. Um, they really, we, we, we don't want there to be any barriers to people really creating an awesome space for teams. Um, just maybe one point that we quickly skipped over, but I do want to go back to and I can, yes, can I, there you go. Um, just remember when you go into your team liftoff session, you do have to prepare for them. So these workshops don't just happen. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. If it's a, if it's a two day workshop, we've pretty much got our, kind of our prep work down to about a day, um, but we used to spend, if it were a two day workshop, we'd spend three to four days preparing for it. So it is a lot of prep. Um, kind of come up with an idea of what you know you need to take. This at a very high level is what we originally did for this workshop quite a while ago. But it just gives you an idea of the kinds of things you can think about when you're getting ready to take your teams through this. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, are there any questions on anything that we did? Oh, this is actually for this workshop. So we, if you want to have a chat, I can give you an idea of what I usually play around with. Um, I'm trying to remember, did we ever put it in the booklets? We never... No, I think it also depends on maybe which techniques you use for which section and all of that. Um, I think the, the point of that facilitation guide is that actually the level of detail for the activities in the liftoff guide is the level of detail we start with to say this is exactly how we run it. Uh, if you're doing the values, we're going to time box it to five minutes to pick your individual values. So that facilitation, preparation and that and, and sticking to the time boxes is so important because this stuff you can take, you know what I mean, you can just keep going. Um, so it depends which techniques you use and to almost go into that detail and just really be strict with that, with that timing. I don't know if that helps. So an Agile Charter usually has a lot more of your product information in. So we don't have it in the team liftoff. We like to split them because um, we find teams often bulk them in and they're, they're, they're almost two different hats that you're wearing. One is more product focused and one is more team focused. So our product liftoff tends to take us three days. And at the end of that, we'll actually have an initial product backlog. And then the team liftoff and the product liftoff together is your Agile Charter and also the initial product backlog. So that's where we go into the product vision and we understand the metrics behind the product as well. So there's an overlap, but this is team specific. But then... So we often use, um, I like to use something that Ellen Gossestiner did, which is a discover to deliver. Um, I find it's really good for teams that are new to an agile way of working. It gives them a level of insight that they don't often get with other techniques. So you still bring in things like user story mapping, that kind of thing. So we can have a chat about it afterwards if you want to go, yeah, it's a particular passion of mine is product, product focused stuff. So are there any other questions about the workshop that we've run? Talked about <laughs> you talked about personal <laughs> goals and you took a very good example of uh, somebody who was pursuing CBAP and you know he had his uh, priorities he wanted to attain certain experience so 
uh, actually uh, there is a live scenario that happened with me way back in my previous organization there was a tester in my team who wanted to become do a career transition to a business analyst and he was appearing for ccba or cbap i don't remember but then he required similar kind of uh, experience in certain knowledge areas like requirement elicitation and gathering requirement design which are not a uh, tester which don't fall under tester kras now he sought for you know those kind of so this sounds like a conversation you and me can have afterwards. yeah is that is that fine do you want to hang around we can no, just I will, I will just summarize it okay. so he wanted to do something which was uh, on, on a live project yeah. which we could not afford so we had to turn it down turn uh, turn how turn down his uh, aspiration there mm -hmm. so how how can we manage that so i don't think all environments are always going to be suitable for every person um, this makes it clear if it's something that the team can help them with right. up front. So it is something that you can kind of get out there and either you can come up with an agreement in the team about how you make it an environment they can still tolerate and work in. Um, we've worked in teams where it did not meet someone's career aspirations and the team actually helped them move into another team um, because they, w you know, they knew that that, that person was going to be unfulfilled in their role and it's important to, to be happy. So it's probably not a nice answer, um, but you don't, yeah, sometimes not all environments are perfect for everyone. So I think, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, we will be around. We are very happy. We've got some extra material. If you want to come and grab some, you're welcome. We do. We've shopped a lot. So <laughs> come and lighten up our suitcase for us. Um, but yeah, just thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully there's a little bit of inspiration to kind of make some of these techniques your own. And follow us on Twitter. Okay, thank you.